الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله continue on in our جلسات of عقيدة توحيد I believe we are now in the seventh uh, lesson seventh جلسة I believe and we reach the portion of the of the compilation in fact where he's talking about different points uh, with regards to Tawheed and deriving the concepts of Tawheed from the book and the Sunnah. And he mentions Kitab al-Tawheed. He says, the story of the Indian scholar who embraced the Aqidah to Salafiyah, and the reason was due to him reading Kitab al-Tawheed of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala. This had been narrated to me by an actual witness. Abdul Abdul Awwal ibn Hamad al-Ansari said, this story briefly is that one of the scholars of Najd gave a scholar from the scholars of India the book, the book Tawheed by Sheikh Islam Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab. But he removed the cover, so when this scholar read this book, he accepted the belief of what was in it. And this is a well-known story, unless this has happened on various occasions, because I've listened to several scholars mention this same story. Uh, a very similar story. Uh, for example, our Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Abdurazak al-Badr. I've heard him say that, mention this, uh, something similar to this. I've also heard our, our Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad Hashim, uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, also known as Abu Salah al-Afghani, one of our Kuwaiti scholars, Hafizullah Ta'ala, also mentioned stories uh, related to this. And even in his own fruits of da'wah, that uh, you'll find that if you look at the contents, if people remove what's in their hearts and their preconceptions about the name Muhammad ibn Wahhab, and they actually look into his writings, and they see what he, he, he propagated, especially in his small recital about Aqidah and Tawheed, and just, uh, uh, you'll find it's about the ta'deem of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as was mentioned, as um, Sheikh Abdul Razak, I believe he mentions, he says, you know, that the scholar who was reading that, that he was thinking, is this Bukhari? Is this Muslim? What have you given me? He said, no. This is the one that you kept cursing on the mimbar and saying Wahhabis and this and that and the other. But this is what he gave. And so this was a, a form of da'wah. So it shows us there's many paths of da'wah. The da'wah to Tawheed, the da'wah to Kitab or Sunnah. And another fa'ida that we benefit from this, because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions. They think that when the Salafi da'wah, that there's no fiqh, that you should just blast people and you should get on the mimbar and scream Salafiya and you should be de declaring everybody to be a mubtada. Because there's no way you can separate Salafiya from the book and the Sunnah and the Menhaj of the Salaf. And there's no way you can separate Salafiyah from fiqh, fiddin. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man yirid Allah bi khayrin, yafiqhu fiddin. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him fiqh, understanding of the religion. So understanding the religion means hikmah. And it means going back to the asas, the book and the sunnah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the book. In, in the book. He says to, to call them, bilatihi asan. You know, call the people to that which is better. Jadiluhum bilatihi asan. You know, Call them and, and, and debate with them with that which is better. And that means with mo with uh, with uh, you know, having uh, beautiful preaching. That's Kitab Sunnah. That's the understanding of the Salaf. That's Minaj Salafiyah. And so many people have this con a false concept because they've seen bad examples of Salafiyah or people who are not even Salafi who claim to be Salafi representing the Dawah to Tawheed. And in fact, they're representing themselves in their bid'ah. SubhanAllah. That's amazing. Someone claims Salafiyah, but what they're really representing is bid'ah and hizbiyah. They're calling to themselves, they're calling to their clique, they're calling to their crew. billah. And then they build their own false principles in a soul. That's why the scholars mention Al-Ibra. Bi haqaiq, laysa bi musamiyat. The reality of something is in its, in, in its reality. Not in its name. <coughs> so the Sheikh he then began <coughs> he began then to talk about some of the usul of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, some of the base issues in Aqidah. 
he said, he started talking about uh, the concept of Estoa, you know, that a lost matter rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty. He said, regarding the famous statement of Imam Malik, Estoa, because Imam Malik, Imam, uh, Imam Adarul Hijra, uh, the great Imam, the, the, that's Imam Malik, you know, one of the four Imams in the religion that have a codified medheb in fiqh. And all of them had the aqidah of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam uh, uh, Malik, wa Imam Shafi'i, wa Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Rahimahumullah Jami'an. So Imam Malik, he said, the people of knowledge say about it, indeed it is the constitution for all of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when we look at this ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, seven ayats, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Ar-Rahman ala ars istawa, the most merciful rules above his throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hu ladhi khalaqakum ma fi al-ardi jami'an thumma istawa, thua istawa ila sama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hu ladhi khalaqakum khalaqakum He's the one who created everything in the earth, Jamian, all of it. Then he rose, you know, above the heavens. So that doesn't take for us to speculate and say, oh, does that mean he was below the heavens before? Does it mean this? Does it mean he has a direction? Does it mean he have a mekan? Those aren't the kind of questions that Ahl Sunnati will jama'a in the past. They asked these questions. Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anima jama'in accepted those ayat on his dahir. And they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he rose in a manner that suits his majesty. That's the aqid of Ahl Sunnati will jama'a. And that's why the Shaykh is mentioned in the here because many of the people of innovation, bid'ah and desires, they deviated with that because they began to infer. And they make false inferences. And then they develop a new bid'ah to refute those inferences. Wallah mistah. So he added, it is Imam Malik saying al Istoa is known, the cave is not as unintelligible or as unintelligent and questioning it is bid'ah. So basically, he's talking about one of the statements, it's, it's an ather of Imam Malik, and it's mentioned in many of the books like uh, Tamheed, uh, Tamheed, a Tamheed by uh, Ibn Abdul Bar. Uh, it's a very important ather that Ahl Sunnah uses to show you the aqid of Ahl Sunnah with Jama'ah, especially the, the Aqid of, you know, Imam Malik, who was one of the, uh, you know, was our salaf. And he said, when he was asked, he was in a, a dars, he was teaching in the haram. And uh, one of the, one of his students at the time, you know, was in the dars. I mean, it was actually probably a dars, probably filled with students. But he, he asked, and he said, Ya Aba Abdullah, O father of Abdullah. Cave is stoa. How did he rise? You know, so he wanted to know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above his throne. He's hearing these ayat. How? What did Imam Malik do? So Imam Malik, he began to sweat, sweat profusely. You know, he, he, he in the, some of the narrations, it mentions that he was looking down, sweating profusely when he heard this. You know, because he was like, you know, shows you how the Salaf were about you know, these issues of Aqid and stuff. They didn't really joke with that. You know, it was so serious. It was serious to their heart. It caused them even almost stress and, and things like this, you know, to hear, you know, Ahl Bid'ah come up with a new Bid'ah and a new Shubha. So he said, he said, uh, Al-Kayf, he said, uh, Al-Istawa Ma'lum. Wa- uh, this is a, one of the, or this is a paraphrase of what he said. So he said, uh, 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 He said, rising is, is known, because we know what rising means in the Arabic language. And yes, we use Arabic language. We're not using Japanese. We're not using Chinese. We're not using English. We're not using uh, <coughs> Somali or Oromo or Tigray, you know. This is the language that those imams spoke, and it was the language that the Quran was revealed in. So he said, uh, uh, he said, Al-Istawa uh, Ma'lum, it's known. He said, a cave, how is Majhul? That's unknown. We don't know that. We've, we're ignorant about that. We're ignorant about that. 
That's, we can't even comprehend that. And Allah didn't tell us about that. The Prophet ﷺ didn't give us any details about that. So we stop with the nasus. We stop with the text. So he said, Al-Kayf Majhul. It's unknown. Wasual anhu bid'ah. Wa anta mubtadia. In another narration. So he said, and, and asking about it is an innovation. And basically, I see you to be an innovator. So he kicked them out of his circle. So this is, shows you how the Salaf were vigilant in Aqidah and that this is a principle of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And it's very dangerous for the people of desires. Uh, and it's basically their menhaj is built upon. Uh, this is one of the, the things is they deviate with regards to that, uh, this aspect of Tawheed, the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine, divine names and attributes. Uh, also, another important thing that you'll find in the books of Aqidi, he says, where is the law? He said, indeed, a sha'ira, okay, the Ashadis, say, indeed, Allah Ta'ala is in every place. Abdul Awul bin Hamad al-Ansari adds, meaning that they negate al-ulu, uh, Allah being high, you know, being raising above his throne and being high uh, and uh, above his creation, and this saying of theirs is falsehood. So he's just saying that that is batal, and we just talked a little bit about it. Wahtatu uh, wujud also, you know, so he mentions about, you know, some of his statements about refuting these aqidas of some of the extreme Sufis. So he said, my father was asked about the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila. Are they regarded as kuffar? He answered, they are not regarded as kuffar until the evidence is established against them. The questioner asks, what about the people of Wahdat al-Wujud, the unity of existence, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one with his creation. He said, as for them, then they are regarded as kuffar. You know, they, they are known as disbelievers. So, this is a part of the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'ah. He said, Aqidah follows an empire. He said, indeed, this country. So here he was praising Saudi Arabia. And this is what, I know a lot of people, they have a problem with Saudi Arabia. But... Like anyone, you see buyukhti, they make mistakes and they get things correct. And no one says anybody is a perfect leader or that we have a khalifa or anything like this. But the problem is, is people spend their attacks on the place. There's no doubt it's a dola to tawheed. I just don't understand anybody who can debate otherwise. And anyone who debates that, I, I would just really say they're not from Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Because they've negated some important principles. I don't really want to get into those issues right now, but perhaps in another dars specifically related to that topic. And that doesn't mean, you know, we support everything that the leaders do and that the leaders don't make mistakes and the leaders don't do, make sins and they don't, uh, you know, do uh, munkar and stuff. That's not what we're saying. But we're, we're given the haq where the haq is due. That that place, there's nothing like it on the earth. Anybody who's lived there or visited there, should be able to acknowledge that. And I know so many Mubtadiyah who are not satisfied with Saudi Arabia, but they love earning their living there, and they love being there. They all love, even they don't want to go back to Jordan, they don't want to go back to Egypt, even though they're hardcore Qawana Muslimin, and some of them are hardcore secular, but they still enjoy the safety and stability that Saudi Arabia offers because of Tawheed. That's the funny thing, the contradictions. And it's protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, it will continue on the khair that it offers, and we hope that they can rein in the sins and come back to strength on Tawheed. So he says, indeed, this country has a great excellence of knowledge and scholars. Indeed, it has spread knowledge internally, externally. May Allah reward it with good. So if a person examined the world today, he will not find those who serve knowledge like they do. Africa and its people are generally uh, Asha'ira, Kulabiya, India is Hanafi, Maturidiya, and Yemen is Mu'tazila, Zaydiya. And these three types of people are the majority nowadays, he says. The Hanafis, Maturidiyah, are the lion's share in majority and being widespread because they were the rulers at the time of the Ottoman Empire. Knowledge in Aqidah follows an empire. Without an empire, there is no knowledge. The reason why people are deviated away from the Aqidah to Salafia are these sects. When the Hanafis were in control of the judiciary at the time of the Abbasid Empire, they carried out a distortion and alteration of the Aqidah to Salafia and distancing it from society and replacing it with the Aqidah of Mu'tazila al Jahmiyyah. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Whereas the Aqidah before them was the pure Aqidah to Salafia. So it shows us, Ahabat that in these fairs, we really need to research, we need to look in these, in, these issues, 
And we need to look at what's, what's clear from the empirical e evidence of what Sardia, their, their propagators of Tawheed, they, that, that Balad has so much khair to offer us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve it and all the Bilad and Muslimin and to guide us all, forgive us all, protect us all, bless us all to be on the Kitab wa Sunnah. And until our next sitting, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad.